Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I present here some results related to the digamma and trigamma functions. The digamma function is the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. The trigamma function is the derivative of the digamma function. We have uh, these inequalities. Log x minus 1 over 2x minus digamma of x is positive and is upper bounded by the minimum of 1 over 2x and 1 over 12x squared. Trigamma of x minus 1 over x minus 1 over 2x squared is positive and is upper bounded by 1 over 6x cubed. I also study the function x times log x minus digamma of x, where x is a positive real number. This function is convex and strictly decreasing. There are also these limit statements that can be derived using these inequalities. This is the series representation of the digamma function. Digamma of x is minus small gamma, Euler Mascaroni constant, plus summation over non negative integer g of 1 over g plus 1 minus 1 over g plus x. The first derivative is summation over non integer g of 1 over g plus x squared. Gamma of x plus 1 is equal to x gamma of x. If we take the logarithm of both sides, we get that log gamma of x plus 1 is equal to log gamma of x plus log x. If we differentiate both sides with respect to x, we get that di gamma of x plus 1 is equal to di gamma of x plus 1 over x. If we differentiate another time, we get that the tri gamma of x plus 1 is equal to tri gamma of x minus 1 over x squared. If we differentiate again, we get that the first derivative of the tri gamma function of x plus 1 is the first derivative of the tri gamma function evaluated at x plus 2 over x squared. The function sine x over x has this product representation, product over positive integer k of 1 minus x squared over pi squared k squared. If we replace x on both sides by i x over 2, we get here sine i x over 2 divided by i x over 2. Sine i x over 2 is equal to i, the hyperbolic sine of x over 2. After doing this substitution, sine x over x becomes the hyperbolic sine of x over 2 over x over 2. This x squared is replaced by minus x squared over 4. The hyperbolic sine of x over 2 over x over 2 is the product over positive integer k of 1 plus x squared over 4 pi squared k squared. Take the logarithm of both sides. We get that the log of the hyperbolic sine of x over 2 minus log x over 2. The logarithm of the product is the sum of logarithms. So we have summation over positive integer k of log 1 plus x squared over 4 pi squared k squared. If we differentiate both sides with respect to x, from here we get 1 over the hyperbolic sine of x over 2. Then we have the hyperbolic cosine of x over 2 times 1 half. That's 1 half the hyperbolic cotangent of x over 2. The derivative of log x over 2 is 1 over x. When we differentiate this logarithm, we get a ratio. In the denominator, we have 1 plus x squared over 4 pi squared k squared by the chain rule. In the numerator, we get 2x over 4 pi squared k squared. Multiplying upstairs and downstairs by 4 pi squared k squared, we get 2x divided by x squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. Multiplying both sides by 1 half and replacing x by t, we get this important result that 1 over 4 times the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2 minus 1 over 2t is summation k from 1 to infinity t over t squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. Multiply both sides by e to the minus xt, and let's integrate over positive real number t the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2 can be written as e to the t over 2 plus e to the minus t over 2. Downstairs, we have the same two exponentials, but with a minus sign between them. Multiply numerator and denominator by e to the minus t over 2. So this ratio can be written as 1 plus e to the minus t over 1 minus e to the minus t. Now we do the following changes. This 1 plus e to the minus t is written as 1 minus e to the minus t plus 2 e to the minus t. We also have this exponential over t, and we can write it as e to the minus xt minus e to the minus t plus e to the minus t divided by t. This integral here can be written in this form. We have minus e to the minus t over t. Using this part, we have plus e to the minus xt minus t divided by 1 minus e to the minus t. This is one integral. e to the minus xt times these two terms over 2. 1 minus e to the minus t over 1 minus e to the minus t, that's 1. We are left with e to the minus xt divided by 2. The remaining terms are e to the power minus t minus e to the minus xt, all divided by t. We split this integral into these three integrals. This one gives 1 over 2x. e to the minus t minus e to the minus xt can be written as integral u from 1 to x, e to the minus t u. The integrand is real valued and non-negative. We can do the integration in any order of our choice. So if we integrate first with respect to t, we get 1 over u. This double integral becomes a single integral, u from 1 to x, 1 over u, which is log x minus log 1, that's log x. Here is log x. Now we have this integral. This is Gauss integral representation of the di gamma function. Specifically, this integral here is di gamma of x plus 1. And we know that di gamma of x plus 1 is equal to di gamma of x plus 1 over x. This integral can be written as log x minus 1 over 2x minus di gamma of x. We are interested in finding bounds on this quantity here. 
to get the bounds, we make use of this representation involving an integral and an infinite sum. Differentiating both sides with respect to x and multiplying by minus 1, we get trigamma of x minus 1 over x minus 1 over 2x squared. And then in the integral, this t becomes t squared. Note that t is a positive real number. The integrand here and there is positive. This means that this quantity and that one are positive. If we want to upper bound, let's focus on this summation here. Summation k from 1 to infinity, 1 over t squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. This fraction is upper bounded by 1 over 4 pi squared k squared. The sum k from 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared is zeta of 2. That's pi squared over 6. This summation here is upper bounded by 1 over 24. An upper bound on this quantity is 2 over 24. That's 1 over 12. Integral t from 0 to infinity t e to the minus x t dt. This is 1 over 12 x squared. If we want an upper bound on this part here involving the trigamma function, the only difference is that this t becomes t squared. The upper bound is 1 over 6x cubed. We have established these inequalities. Log x minus 1 over 2x minus digamma of x is positive and is upper bounded by 1 over 12x squared. Trigamma of x minus 1 over x minus 1 over 2x squared is also positive and is upper bounded by 1 over 6x cubed. This is the representation of the function log x minus 1 over 2x minus digam of x developed on the previous page. Let's do further manipulation. We have this quantity here, 1 over u squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. This can be written as the imaginary part of 1 over 2 pi k minus i u. If we multiply numerator and denominator by 2 pi k plus i u, we get this quantity in the denominator. In the numerator, we have 2 pi k plus i u, and the imaginary part is u. In other words, we can replace u divided by u squared plus 4 pi squared k squared by the imaginary part of 1 over 2 pi k minus i u. This can be written as integral t from 0 to infinity e to the minus t 2 pi k minus i u. The imaginary part of e to the i u t is sine u t. Interchanging the order of summation and integration, we have the sum over positive integer k of e to the minus 2 pi t all to the power k. This is a convergent geometric series. It is equal to e to the minus 2 pi t over 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi t. Multiplying numerator and denominator by e to the 2 pi t, log x minus 1 over 2x minus digamma of x is 2 times the double integral u from 0 to infinity, t from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x u sine u t over 2 pi t minus 1. Interchanging the order of integration, and when we integrate first with respect to u, we have this classical integral, which gives us t divided by t squared plus x squared. We have this integral representation for the function of interest, Integral t from 0 to infinity, 2t divided by e to the 2 pi t minus 1 times t squared plus x squared. Let's examine this part of the integrand. The function t over e to the 2 pi t minus 1, denoted here by g of t. If we differentiate g of t once with respect to t, we get minus, and then a ratio, 1 minus e to the 2 pi t times this bracket, 1 minus 2 pi t. Downstairs, we have the square of e to the 2 pi t minus 1. We have the inequality that for every theta in R, e to the theta is greater than or equal to 1 plus theta. Now, for theta, use minus 2 pi t, e to the minus 2 pi t is greater than or equal to 1 minus 2 pi t. Multiply both sides by e to the 2 pi t, we get that 1 is greater than or equal to 1 minus 2 pi t, e to the 2 pi t. This means that this numerator here is positive, the first derivative is negative. This function is strictly decreasing on the positive real axis. As t tends to infinity, this function tends to 0. What about the value this function approaches when t tends to 0 from above? We can apply L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of t is 1. The derivative of e to the 2 pi t minus 1 is 2 pi e to the 2 pi t. And when t tends to 0 from above, we get 1 over 2 pi. So this function, g of t, which is this part of the integrand, is upper bounded by 1 over 2 pi. It strictly decreases and tends to 0 as t tends to infinity. We can use this result to upper bound this integral. Now, this part is upper bounded by 1 over 2 pi. So the integral is upper bounded by 1 over 2 pi, integral over positive t of 2x over t squared plus x squared. Doing the integration, we get 1 over pi, the inverse tangent of 2 over x. Using the limits of integration, this inverse tangent is pi over 2, so the upper bound is 1 half. This integral here is less than or equal to 1 over 2. We have this limit result that limit as t tends to 0 from above of t over e to the 2 pi t minus 1 is 1 over 2 pi. 
This means that for every positive epsilon, there is a positive delta such that for every t in the open interval from zero to delta, we have the absolute value of t over e to the two pi t minus one minus one over two pi less than epsilon over two pi. This implies that t over e to the two pi t minus one is greater than one over two pi minus epsilon over two pi. So let's go back to this integral. We can lower bound this integral by just integrating from zero to delta because the integrand is real valued and non-negative. Then the function g of t, which is this part, is lower bounded by one over two pi minus epsilon over two pi, which can be taken outside. This integral is lower bounded by one minus epsilon over two pi integral x from zero to delta to x over two squared plus x squared. If we carry out the integration, we get the lower bound as one minus epsilon over pi times the inverse tangent of delta over x. This part here in the lower bound can be made arbitrarily close to pi by choosing x sufficiently small. Because the limit of this part as x tends to zero from above is pi, this limit statement implies that for every positive epsilon, there is a positive x bar. If x is between zero and x bar, then the absolute value of this function to the inverse tangent of delta over x minus pi is less than epsilon pi. This implies that to the inverse tangent of delta over x is greater than pi minus pi epsilon. The lower bound on this integral can further be lower bounded by pi over one minus epsilon by employing a sufficiently small x. Note that this lower bound is equal to one half minus epsilon plus one half epsilon squared, which is greater than one half minus epsilon. The point now is that for every positive epsilon, there is an x bar, which generally depends on epsilon. And if x is between zero and x bar, we can make this integral greater than one half minus epsilon. As derived above, this integral itself is less than or equal to one half, which is strictly less than one half plus epsilon. For every epsilon, there is a range of small x values that will make the absolute value of this integral minus one half less than epsilon. This is exactly what it means to say that the limit of this integral as x tends to zero from above is one half. On the previous page, we obtained that log x minus one over two x minus di gamma of x is equal to integral over positive t of t over e to the two pi t minus one, two over t squared plus x squared, multiply both sides by x, so we get x log x minus di gamma of x, and this is the function f of x minus one half is this integral. Moving one half to the right hand side, we get that f of x is one half plus integral t from zero to infinity, two t x over e to the two pi t minus one times t squared plus x squared. On the previous page, we have found that this integral approaches one half as x tends to zero from above. So the limit of f of x as x tends to zero from above is one half plus one half, that's one. We have also discovered that this integral is less than or equal to one half, which means that f of x is less than one. Log x minus di gamma of x is less than one over x. Subtract one over two x from both sides. We get that log x minus one over two x minus di gamma of x is less than one over two x. On the second page, we studied this function and obtained the upper bound one over 12 x squared. We can say that this function, which is positive, is upper bounded by the minimum of one over two x and one over 12 x squared. The minimum is upper bounded by either term. Let's take one over 12 x squared. Multiply both sides by x. So we get x log x minus di gamma of x minus one half is less than or equal to one over 12 x. Add one half to all sides. The limit of the lower and upper bounds as x tends to infinity is one half thereby indicating that function f of x tends to one half as x tends to infinity. The function f of x tends to one as x tends to zero from above and tends to one half as x tends to infinity. In fact, function f of x strictly decreases from one to one half. We can show this by investigating the first derivative of the function. The first derivative of f is given by this integral. Split the integral into an integral from zero to x. So here t is less than x and another integral from x to infinity, in that integral t is greater than x. We want to upper bound this quantity. Note that here t is less than x, so this part is negative. This is function g of t from the previous page. This function is strictly decreasing. So the value of this function at any t between zero and x is lower bounded by x over e to the two pi x minus one. 
but this is multiplied by a negative number. So this integral here can be upper bounded by this ratio, which can be taken outside times the integral t from zero to x of this ratio. In that integral, t is greater than x, so this ratio is positive. This is a decreasing function of t. So it is upper bounded by replacing t by its minimum possible value here, which is x. This integral is upper bounded by this ratio, which can be taken outside the integral. And then we have integral t from x to infinity, then this function. We can recombine both integrals and obtain this upper bound x over e to the 2 pi x minus 1 integral over positive t of this ratio. Now let's do a change of variables t equal to x tan u. t squared plus x squared is equal to x squared 1 plus tan squared u, which is sec squared u. And when we square, we get x to the power 4, sec u to the power 4. dt is x sec u squared du. We have x times x squared times x. These go away with x to the 4 in the denominator. We end up with integral u from 0 to pi over 2, tan u squared minus 1 times cosine u squared. That's the integral of sine u squared minus cosine u squared. These two functions have the same integral from 0 to pi over 2. The integral of the difference is exactly equal to 0. The upper bound on the first derivative is 0. The first derivative of function f, which is x times log x minus diagram of x, is negative. Function f of x is strictly decreasing. The last thing to show is that it is also a convex function. What we do is we differentiate again with respect to x. We differentiate under the integral sign. We get this integral. Here it is after simplification. We get this part, x squared minus 3t squared. We do steps similar to what we have done during the investigation of the first derivative. Because we have here x squared minus 3t squared, we split the integral into an integral from 0 to x over the square root of 3. In that integral, this part is positive. And then another integral from x over square root 3 to infinity. This part is negative. We want to lower bound. This function is decreasing in t. So we can lower bound it by setting t equal to its maximum possible value here, which is x over the square root of 3. And this lower bound can be taken outside the integral. This ratio is negative. We want a lower bound on the second derivative of f. So we need an upper bound on this part here. Because this is a decreasing function, the upper bound is the value of the function with t replaced by x over the square root of 3. Again, this can be taken outside the integral, and we can combine both integrals as an integral t from 0 to infinity. This is the lower bound on the second derivative. We use the same substitution like above. We get the integral of this difference here. To evaluate these integrals, we use the beta function. Beta of m and n is 2 integral u from 0 to pi over 2 sine u to the power 2m minus 1, cosine u to the power 2n minus 1. One integral gives one half of beta of 1 over 2 and 5 over 2. The other integral is 3 over 2 times beta of 3 over 2 and 3 over 2. Using the fact that beta of m and n is gamma of m, gamma of n over gamma of the sum, and the fact that gamma of x plus 1 is x gamma of x, we find that this difference is exactly equal to 0. The lower bound on the second derivative is 0. The second derivative is positive, thereby indicating that this function f of x, which is x log x minus di gamma of x, is a convex function.